Hi, I'm Jonathan Weinberg. From September 11, 2022 to January 5, 2023, I've had the honor to have an exhibition at the Eli Center for Art in New Haven of my Genesis window paintings and my prints. On Sunday, December 4th, the center hosted a panel discussion with Rabbi James Panette, moderated by Professor Michael LaBelle. It was recorded and it's now presented here. Rabbi James Panette was the Howard M. Hulsman Jewish chaplain at Yale, where he had served as a religious leader since 1981. He earned his undergraduate degree from Yale in religious studies and his master's and doctoral degree from Hebrew Union College, where he was ordained in 1973. Jim was a visiting lecturer at Yale Law School, where he taught a course on Job, Job and Injustice. He also taught a college seminar in Timothy Dwight on the family and the Jewish tradition with Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Currently, he teaches a course at the Divinity School entitled Introduction to American Judaism. Michael LaBelle is professor of art history at Hunter College, CUNY. He received his BAA in studio art from Wesleyan Uni University and an MA and PhD in art history from Yale University. He's the author of three books, Image Duplicator, Roy Lichtenstein and the Emergence of Pop Art, James Rosenquist, Pop Art, Politics and History in the 1960s, and John Sloan, Drawing on Illustration, for which he was awarded the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Charles C. Eldridge Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Art. Both uh, Jim and Michael are are very dear friends, so it was really a wonderful thing to be talking with them. It's like talking with my extended family about really important things, as you'll see, religion and art, uh, etc. It was a, a really lovely um, discussion. Uh, let me say first, though, a little bit about the project. Um, the paintings on glass and the prints in the exhibition at the Eli Center represent several years of work. Undoubtedly, they are response to the dramatic quality of our recent politics, COVID, and being hunkered down with a small circle of friends and family. But also, they are influenced by my work as, as the curator of the Marie Sendak Foundation, and the opportunity has given me to spend so much time with Sendak's extraordinary art, as well as the prints by the artists he's collected, like William Blake and Felix Vallotton. I came upon the subject matter through a circuitous route. About five years ago, I started experimenting paint with painting on mylar with something called plaid gallery glass, a medium sold to craft stores that imitates the look of stained glass. My first paintings were installed in the windows of my house. Inspired by William Blake, I chose to represent Jacob's Ladder from Genesis because its theme of transcendence always has seemed to me to resonate with the artist's task of taking mundane materials and transforming them into something wonderful. I paired these images with the building of Noah's Ark, a story of salvation and hope amidst the most traumatic of times. During the COVID crisis, when I was stuck at home, I began to make prints and I turned back to these themes by rereading Genesis and finding key stories that I could turn into pictures. The prints were produced using a complex hybrid process. I initially drew them on my iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil using the program Procreate and reworking them in Photoshop on a Windows PC. Then I used a laser printer to make relief plates, which I printed on a small etching press at home. These prints were then scanned and reworked and printed again. Finally, the images were digitally transferred to polymer plates and printed letterpress on Somerset Velvet 200 uh, GSM radiant white cover, 100% cotton rag paper by Dan Wood and his team at DWRI Letterpress in Providence, Rhode Island. The result is a box suite of 16 prints limited to an edition of 50. Each image is printed on a 9 by 12 inch sheet, except for Noah's Ark, which folds out to be a panoramic 12 by 18 inches. The portfolio is housed in a special archival acid-free box that is printed with the title Genesis in gold foil. As a matter of fact, they, uh, there are several um, copies that are available uh, still. The prints are full of allusions to famous works of art by artists ranging from Masaccio to Blake, Picasso to David, Homer to Sendak. In other words, I put my training as an art historian into good use. 
The designs of the prints became the template for the glass paintings. Although these translucent pictures themselves do not move, the effect of the changing light outside animates them. I particularly enjoy the experience of seeing the windows on the outside at night. I also appreciate using such an inexpensive and inexpensive medium to create a dramatic, even spiritual effect. This, for me, was the essence of Jacob's dream, how in a completely banal place, resting on a hard stone, he fell asleep and dreamt of angels climbing to heaven in God's grace. Uh, so what we'll do now is Michael LaBelle will say a few words, and then uh, we'll switch to the actual panel. I'm really thrilled and honored that Jonathan invited me here to have a conversation about his work. Um, and just so that everyone knows, I was very fortunate to have Jonathan as my dissertation advisor at Yale. And ever since then, um, I've had the good fortune of having him as someone um, to have many dialogues and conversations about art. And really, um, Jonathan is someone who has shaped my thinking about art and art history over the last 25 years. But if any of you are interested, for instance, I mean, isn't there the, the piece of yours that's in the Met Museum collection? Yes. Sort of, if you look at the kind of gridding up there Definitely. or through here, and then you can go on uh, at the, the Met, uh, in the Met collection, Jonathan has a piece and you'll see and that piece is probably from the 80s, right? Right, it's yeah. 83, and also it's a religious subject matter. It's funny, the, there was a show in 1980s that, um, where I, I heard about it, it was called The Saint Show, and I, had, I have a very good friend, Joel Handorf, and he said, you know, if you quickly do a painting that has something to do with the saint, <laughs> you can get in this show, right? <laughs> and I was doing these paintings of, of the pier, right. the waterfront, and I thought, well, how can I get a saint into the piers of the waterfront? And I could, from my art history, I knew that St. Catherine had been martyred on a wheel. So I thought, well, I'll do this painting of a kind of weird wheel, and I'll put it in the, in the pier, and I'll call it St. Catherine. And that painting was in the show, and then it was, and then amazingly, it was bought by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So that's how, how it got into the museum. But it's kind of funny that even then I was doing a kind of religious painting, but it was, but it wasn't my intention, but I've sort of gone back to that. Which is sort of a, a good segue yes. to Jim a little bit. And I mean, and also Jim, I would love you to be a interviewer as well if you want to ask questions of Jonathan. Yeah. But you know, when when Jonathan invited me to do this and I knew I was going to be on you know a panel with a rabbi which is a little intimidating because i went to hebrew school and i was raised in a conservative jewish household but one of the first things i thought about was jim you know the 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 traditional jewish prescription of graven images right and it was interesting because i realized that there is a tradition of artists you know dealing with those restrictions and not and can you say a little bit about, you know, from your standpoint, that kind of what, you know, pressure or parameters those restrictions have set on artists who have wanted to, you know, make images or not? Obviously, there are many artists who don't have those pres prescriptions. I, I can say a little bit, but Peg Olin is here. She can say much more than I about that <laughs> in a much more informed way. I can talk about the Jewish side of it in, in a way that they, yeah. Uh, Balance and anything they could add later, but uh, um, uh, it's the second commandment. So it's a commandment, the, the, the first of the 10 utterances that, you know, in, in the West, we call them commandments, but in the uh, rabbinic tradition that controls what Jews think the book means, or used to control what Jews used to think the book meant. <laughs> um, um, in that, in that uh, enduring attempt that is over um, the the notion uh, of the ten utterances. The first utterance is "I am." The second utterance is "You will not have any other." And then it goes on to elaborate. You won't make any images. You won't make any uh, any other god of any other gods. It doesn't say you can't make images of me. Mm. Um, and um, 
it, it's really uh, it, it's uh, an utterance that establishes the uh, zealous, jealous, uh, and dangerous nature of this God who wants exclusive possession of this people. Uh, and uh, so I don't think this God would rebel against images of this God. Uh, but, but that's me thinking uh, about what that utterance means. So in the tradition, um, uh, it's understood that there are gods and there are idols and, uh, uh, and they're not yours. And, uh, and, and the Bible is filled with a, a sense of an historical struggle against, against idolatry. In fact, in the 12th century, Maimonides, uh, the Talmud actually, earlier in the 8th century, uh, I seeks to identify, define what a Jew is, which has always been a mystery today, perhaps even more so, or uh, contested more, more so, less mysterious, but more contested today. <laughs> um, uh, and that is, uh, a Jew is one who opposes idolatry. But then, of course, what is idolatry? Um, and so it's sort of a commonplace, you probably got this one, Peg, right, that the reason so many Jewish uh, collectors, if not artists, were involved in what we call modern art had to do with, and, and specifically expressionism and post-figurism and so forth, that, that, that tendency of modernity was somehow connected to a, uh, a flight from, from images. Um, um, so the notion that God is visible or God is not visible is actually a struggle inside of the Hebrew Bible. So austere monotheism understands the absolute invisibility and inaccessibility of God, but that's not the Hebrew Bible. and certainly not the book of Genesis. People bump into God all the time. So for example, in this picture over here, where um, an angel who reminds me of Nick, Oh. <laughs> uh, is, my husband. is, um, is uh, holding uh, back Abraham's hand, uh, Abraham looking a fair amount like Jonathan, uh, yeah. Yeah. With, with, which is holding a knife against, uh, uh, against his son, Isaac. And, and um, um, the, uh, I'm just I'm kind of staggered by the power of that. Um, um, so a, a, an image of that, uh, that that's that explicit, uh, um, you know, might appear in the margins of some medieval Jewish texts, you know, and there were some synagogues uh, that we know about, one of which is here at the Yellow Art Gallery, or Europas, in which there, are, uh, it's clear that there were images of, uh, uh, of stars and animals and, uh, uh, and things of that ilk. So it's not a completely anti-image uh, tradition that emerged from this uh, proscription of the second commandment. Um, but there's enough to it that um, uh, it may have heightened the awareness of, and well, the famous so-called struggle that I guess Matthew Arnold made famous, right, Peg, uh, between the visual and the, and the acoustic, where the Hebrew Bible he claimed was essentially acoustic. You could hear God as in Shema Yisrael, but you couldn't see God. Um, that was the, so the Greek, uh, the Hellenistic Jewish, uh, or Hebraic uh, dialectic was played out that way, according to Matthew's <coughs> stark reading. But then, you know, the recovery of mysticism and modernity has recovered the, uh, the, the sense of the visual that was always there. God is a visual experience in the Hebrew Bible, period. Ezekiel saw God. And God came down to Mount Sinai and had lunch or dinner with the, the elders. Um, and we have images of, uh, you know, God's feet and God's hands and so forth. So there is a strong particularly in the mystical tradition and the mythic mystical tradition, there is this strong uh, force that never fully uh, died. You know, as monotheism failed, the Jews, uh, you know, philosophical Judaism, Maimonides being the great exponent, um, uh, you know, failed uh, to, to remove uh, uh, the artistry, take the art out of the Jew. Is your book called The, the Nation Without Art? Yes, it yeah. is, but that title is, you know, to be taken. I know, I know. I know. It was a, it was you were tracing the anti-Jewish animus among uh, European and German uh, artists in particular, I guess, in in that formulation. Uh, yeah, right. I traced the um, the idea that um, Jews were the nation without art, which is not a Jewish idea. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Not at all. 
Yeah, so this is Margaret Olin. Margaret, yeah, Margaret Olin is a. Yeah, is a, is a yeah. <laughs> I come into justice to the I say Margaret Olin. Wonderful artist. An artist, an art historian, and, and, and she's got a position in the Religious Studies Department here, as well as the History of Art, as well as at the Divinity School. And she's got an exhibit at the Divinity School. Still so, up? Uh, no. no. A photographs. Yeah. yeah. From Palestinian uh, uh, camps in Israel. So speaking of which, I mean, and Jonathan, obviously everything, all of these questions are, you can say no comment, but, you know, <laughs> after, after Jim's sort of delineation of these things, and obviously, as far as I can see, everything you've chosen is from the Old Testament, <laughs> right? Because it's just the first book. And I just right. started <laughs> thinking, like, you know, what was the... I mean, do you want to say anything about the nature of your sense of your own Judaism or what sort of Jewish household? Well, well, it's funny. I think it says a lot because say uh, it's Jim who always would correct me whenever whenever I would say I would say the same thing, Old Testament. And Jim would say, you mean the Bible, right? right? We Jews shouldn't call it the Old Testament. We, it's, it's, it's our Bible, right? That's done that it. But but I mean, one of the things that um is really true about about my take on Genesis is that again and again in a lot of these pictures, including including the one that that Jim is pointing out, which is uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, is is filled with right. right? of Isaac is actually from a David, Jacques Louis David oh, painting of a, of a young revolutionary who was killed wow. or, or when Jacob um, Jacob and Joseph are, are reunited that is the um, the central figure comes from a Rembrandt painting mm. right so um, or there's a scene where Joseph is being put into the pit and that's uh for the well and that's from uh Pantormo, right so so my you know i think about a lot of this work is that i sort of come to the stories over and over again through our history more probably mm -hmm. than from the bible and what happens is that i sort of have this idea in my head about what it should look like and then i have to go back to the bible and read the story again um, because that seems to be more making it for me. You know, it's like creating in my head is, is more the image than I know, whether from the Sistine ceiling, right? Um, you know, uh, Michelangelo, right? That's another one of the great, probably the great, you know, most famous interpretations of Genesis is, is, uh, is the Sistine ceiling. So, uh, you know, it's very complicated, that kind of, um, that kind of, combination i mean i'm interested to hear what jim is saying because uh most of the representations that we're talking about aren't representations of god the representation of the people who might be seeing god or are in some connection with god and how you know i guess this would be a long history but how did it go from being to no images of god or other gods to no images at all that, that, how, how did that, I have a thought on that. I don't know the answer, uh, but the, the and thought, of course, that's part of product, a certain a certain uh, tradition of Protestantism as well. Is the you know, well, of course, Protestantism was as I understand it, and I'm not a historian, that it was you know operating against the right. the the iconic tradition of the Catholic Church. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, it, from a strict biblical Hebrew Bible mm -hmm. point of view, there is an image of God. Mm -hmm. It's the human being. Right, right. Right. So, so um, the question then becomes: Is the second commandment, in fact, to be construed? This was my idiosyncratic right. way of reading, which I'm listening to as I age more and more. Uh, um, but recognize, though, it's mine. So, you know, the norm is uh, images of God are. It, I don't know how it becomes that. The images of God are verboten. You can't right. do that. Um, so, so you don't depict human beings. Because now, maybe that was under Rome. You know, these these right. laws are developed under Rome. This is already post right. right. Under Rome, images of, of of the emperors were gods, right? Mm. So the deification of the human, mm -hmm. um, which is a, one of the uh, horrible uh, or wonderful, depending on how you understand, it, gives right. Christianity to the world, right? right? The deification of the human being, um, or the equal, you know, the yeah, whatever. How we want to deal with that? That's a that's a that's an ongoing issue of enormous 
consequence, right? right? I mean, uh, so uh, so if you made an image of Moses, you might end up worshiping Moses, or there would be a danger. But that, exactly, right? There would be danger that you would you would substitute Moses for a kind of right. Or, and the Bible seems already aware of that, right? right. They're very to them. It's important that Moses is killed off all alone, top of mountain. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where Moses is buried. God buried Moses. Mm -hmm. He says at mm -hmm. the end of Deuteronomy. So they were concerned there'd be no pilgrimage sites. You know. Mm -hmm. Sort of the way the Allies were concerned that Hitler's bunker would not become a pilgrimage site. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, the Bible already had that sense that Moses wasn't God, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the people could, did confuse him for God. In fact, when he just when he doesn't come back on time, according to the people, they build the golden calf, whatever that was about. Mm -hmm. So idolatry as a substitute for this deity, this Deus absconditus, or this leader who's slow in return. Um, is, is already a little bit multi, but it gets expanded and deepened. So yeah, there's something about the human being that is not to be worshipped. But, but the, you know, this is an interesting paradox is that the very idea that you shouldn't do it, of course, gives it more power. That's exactly. The, that's the interesting thing. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. Because I mean, after all, the human being is the image of God. Right. If there is a living image of God, it's the human being. That's basic biblical insight. So what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that Christianity was a valid interpretation of what's already uh, in the Bible. It's not a foreign idea. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a difficult idea. Um, so uh, I guess that's what that that piece comes. But the uh, the sense of you being religious, you said earlier, Jonathan, that uh, you saw the it sounds like your imagination, the biblical imagination, goes back to Jacob's ladder. I mean, mm -hmm. said, yeah, which is amazing. And then you read that as kind of a um, the term you used there was the kind of transcendence, mm -hmm. going up to heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, the image, of course, is that the angels also come back down, mm -hmm. going up and down, right? Um, and, uh, and then Jacob wakes up from that dream, and his reaction was, oh, my God, this is a, this is, there's God is here, and I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. How awesome is this place? Mm -hmm. Man. So, uh, um, so he feels small mm -hmm. having seen this image. But th that image of those angels going up and down is, is foundational. Mm -hmm. I think the Jewish content, inviting the angels on Friday night to accompany mm -hmm. you home from the synagogue as you come home to uh, light the candle, I mean, to make kiddush and, mm -hmm. to, and have you dinner. Um, there's a sense of these angels accompanying us. But you're saying that's actually how you construe the, the task of the artist. Well, this sort of idea, well, they, you know, it's funny because I've always, I'm not quite sure where this picture is, but um, uh, I believe it's a Blake picture, but there's a thing, there is a, there's a very famous Blake -like image of Jacob's ladder, but that's not the one that I have in mind. It may not just be Jacob's ladder, but it's definitely a Blake image of little figures going up, and they have this little, they have this little, um, uh, cartoon balloons and they're saying I want, I want and they're maybe I'm making this up. There's this image of these little figures going up and saying I want. And that's somehow very seems to me like the artist. Somehow that's what the artist is doing. But also taking um well it's like, you know, again this I don't mean this sound egotistical, but this tech, this this medium that I'm using is usually used. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are other artists who use it in a nice way, but it's usually used in this sort of, as I say, sort of hobby stuff to make really kind of, you know, <laughs> drecky things, you know, kitchen things. And, and um, no, I, as far as I know, there's no like serious painter who uses this particular um, medium, right? I'm sure we maybe when we put this out there. Someone's going to come back and be like, hey, uh, Jonathan. Right, right. But um, and in fact, you know, they, they, I, tell, I think they are continuing to make it, but, the, but during the pandemic, you couldn't get it. It was hard to get. And I called the company and they were saying they may stop making it because so few people are even using it. So by the way, uh, Nick, uh, uh, both of us, we, we at the house is filled because I just started ordering every, every <laughs> bottle that you get. So we have tons and tons of it. But anyway, the point is, is you know, taking something that is sort of you know junky and making it into something wonderful that's what artists do i mean paint is not anything but you know, you know it's not that precious a thing and you turn it into something that is incredibly precious to me that is what an artist does. i would call that godly too. right i mean well yeah. in in the last few minutes that the two of you were having that conversation i kept thinking about all of the images and myths of 
God as an artist or yeah. the artist as, as divine, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's all this sort of overlap of the artist as, and it's funny because, I mean, being back here where I did my graduate studies and being with my advisor, I'm thinking about all those prescriptions, like my generation of art historians, we weren't really supposed to talk about art as magic and something really beautiful. And I think in our conversations, like, I do think art is magic, right? It's taking, it, it is. I mean, people can tell me I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. Like you take <laughs> something and you transform it into something else. So it does seem like there are a lot of, there are many, many, many sort of myths and stories that about those two sort of interlinking ideas about God as sort of the first artist, right? Creating, um, and then the artist has, if, and if not a kind of God, someone who's divine or doing a kind of magic. But also, of course, the Bible itself is written in this incredibly beautiful way, yeah. made up of all these different stories that are written by many different people who are who were presumably kind of artists, right? And and then also translated or put into different ways by other by other extraordinary people who turned it into things. So I mean, if I said if I if I were if I said I was religious, it would be the religious religion of art. I mean, I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like what sustains me and why. What I'm very grateful for is that somehow or other in my life, at various, at every point, there's been some passion that I've been able to have for some particular artist or some writer or something that keeps me going, right? That somehow makes life possible, uh, worth living, right? And that, you know, and I realize that for a lot of people, that is what religion is for. Right? But but traditional religion doesn't do that for me. Um, it's it's so this work in a way is more about the religion of art probably than it is about actual actual religion if that makes sense it does i have a yeah. question that i'd like to put you in, right. in the light of that right. thank you michael for permission to do this um you have two pictures here two that that pertain to Noah. Mm -hmm. one you call the deluge mm -hmm. and the other one you call noah's art mm -hmm. um so uh, my question is so sort of got three prongs for me, the two are not you, and you said Noah's Ark symbolizes for you salvation, understandable. Um, however, Noah's Ark also represents the first survivors of the first near total genocide of all of humanity. So we're a people facing extinction today by our own hands. Um, and um, uh, uh, an extinction is our, there's a creation of this God wipes it out. I mean, God is a genocidal madman. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, but God also, it says, was charmed by Noah. He saw beauty. It actually says, Noah matzachim bene Adonai. Noah, God saw Noah's beauty. He saw beauty in Noah. And so Noah's beauty enabled it to be less than a total destruction. And then there's the rainbow. So I guess my question to you is, um, have you thought about the rainbow? And what that symbolizes. And number two, all this notion of taking mediocre materials you know, and turning them into something precious, which is a beautiful metaphor for the creation of the world and for the work uh, that we're specifically celebrating and discussing here, but also in the sense the work of, of all artists, stone, wood, paint. Um, um, the relationship between destruction by God and creation by God. It's got to do with a season where there is no passion, or is it a reverse passion? Or, um, or, uh, okay, I mean, I uh, too much, uh, too much thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where to, where to begin. Well, the rainbow thing is well, this is just a, a funny thing. So the rain, I um, not here, but in my original concept of the Jacob's ladder, I don't know why, but a rainbow. At the top, that they're going up to the rainbow. Ah. But then I didn't, I didn't think to put a rainbow. No, you know, there's no dove either. You know, or, or you know, usually there's a sometimes a little dove with a little, uh, little olive, branch. Branch. olive branch or something like that. I don't know that maybe because I thought that would be a bit corny or something, but I just didn't think about it. I became when you know the kind of the day to dayness that you're doing when you're working. Um, you know, working through something. It was just, I was, 
I would spend so much time in Noah's Ark, like coming up with different pairs of animals and sort of, which you would think would be fairly easy, but I just would find that kind of hard, like how many different animals to put in and, you know, um, and, and, uh, and, and anyway, those are the kinds of things that would suddenly be, you know, again, one thing after another, you get kind of obsessed. And then I didn't think about the rainbow. So it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious decision not to include it. I just in the ark, yeah. You, human beings are just in one square, right. and right. all the rest are animals. There's right. like a, um, there seems to be a kind of a statement there that's different than say the seven days of creation that you have over there. Not right. that they depict it, but humanity can be read as the culmination of creation. Here, you know, they're just part of, uh, you know, part of a larger network. Right. Or right. A web. I like this idea of like splitting. I don't think I invented that. I think I, I definitely stole that from something that I saw. Um, you know. But I like the idea that the ship was sort of split in half and then you have them yeah. and they're different little hotel rooms. You know, so it's more like a visual idea. But, but you know, again, you know, I, as an art historian, when you're interviewing artists, I always get very frustrated with um, you know, artists who are like completely blank and they're like, I don't know, I just did it that way. I just, you know, it seemed funny and then it seems funny that when the giraffe, you know, in the middle that the giraffe space is much taller to allow for the giraffes. <laughs> you know, it just seemed like a funny thing. And also, the, you know, it always bothered me that Noah's Ark thing is just ridiculous. It's just not possible that you could fit all the different animals <laughs> in the ark. It's, it's absurd. And then, you know, I did find out, um, or at least my little bit of research, that they were allowed to have more than um, two, like sheep or chickens and things, because they needed to eat <laughs> apes and stuff. So I thought that was interesting. So I, when I was growing up, I always thought there were just two. Well, the biblical yeah. stories, just yeah. two. All this yeah. is, is right. Yeah. Well, no, I found I found that there, or at least there were discussions of that that they were had to be allowed allowing for, for multiple chickens and things. For like sure, that. but I don't yeah. think the discussion's in the Bible. It's not in the Bible itself. This is an after yeah. afterthought. Well, it could have been even simultaneous and extruded. I, don't know. I see, you know, I right? see. Yeah. Yes, well, interesting. Right. I'm sure there's all kinds of mistakes. Yeah. I mean, Jonathan, it's interesting because, you know, you talked about doing this for a while, and because you're so visually oriented and because you cite, you know, images by others, I always just thought about you working on these from visual sources and then when you talked about actually reading mm -hmm. the bible it made me think about all of these precedents and one that's very present to me right now is rauschenberg's dante where mm -hmm. rauschenberg starting in the late 1950s read one canto uh, of the inferno and then illustrated it and sort of moved on mm -hmm. so did you so he had a very specific sort of programmatic approach to the text did you or was it just sort of a back and forth yeah, it's sort of back and forth just like you're saying so some of the stories you just sort of again because of uh growing up and going to museums knowing the different stories you just sort of know some of the stories very well i mean you know that adam and eve are gonna you know get kicked out of the garden that that's going to be an important image that you need to have right and how important is it to look at the text? But um, you know, and then and then uh, other people, like Frank, since I have friends, not just Jim, but are like, oh my goodness, you have to, you know, go back to the origins. You can't just, you know, you don't use the King James version, and and then I can plot <laughs> list on, you know, did research and whatever. And I found a lot of that very actually in the end not very helpful. Actually, I began to think, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm not, I don't believe that this is the truth. I, I approach it without the idea that it's the truth. Like right. there, there isn't any original to, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. It doesn't, I'm not trying to go back to some original story. In fact, I more want to go to all the misrepresentations in a way. That's just as interesting to me, you know, I'll be <coughs> wrong or, yeah. or is there a way to write to it? Because you get that, Constantly. I mean, you know, just the point that, uh, I mean, this is a, a typical Weinberg point to make, but if you look at uh, Michelangelo's David, right, he's not circumcised, right? Right. right? He should be, but it's not, right? right? Right. But, you know, that's an interesting, actually, an interesting theological or historical question, actually, about why he isn't circumcised. Yeah, right? It is. Right, it right, is. right. Yeah. Right. So, 
Yeah, circumcision itself is a major, uh, major uh, point of historical, theological, yeah. legal uh, implication. Yeah. The stories themselves are so. The other thing that went immediately is struck when you read Genesis is that, um, particularly in terms of the rhetoric often of religious people and how they, you know, the rectitude around it, and then you actually read these stories in there. You know, they're they're kind of crazy. Well, I'm God, we're going to be denounced, but they're but a lot of them are really strange and crazy yeah. and obscene. Yeah, and you know, lurid, 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 lurid and yeah. obscene. You know, um, Lot, you know, his daughters, and you know, I, that was one thing that was too shocking for me to illustrate. I wasn't, I didn't feel like <laughs> illustrating a lot and his daughters, so, you know, sleeping with each other. It didn't seem like something I wanted to represent. You know. So, so you know, the, and the ways in which, of course, people kind of talk around it, or suddenly, you know, suddenly in this place, it's really just a metaphor. It's not, you know, there are ways in which they, it's dealt with, right? right? Oh, there's, yeah, no problem yeah, saying yeah, this is exaggeration. This is not to be read literally multiple levels of yeah, sure. yeah, right, 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 right. Now, if you're gonna, if you're stuck with the text, you can't change it. That's right. what the Talmud did to the to those books that were grown. <laughs> right. um, uh, if you're stuck with them, then you have to come up with rules for reading them, right? That's so right. You, yeah, so you don't have because you can't expurgate, you can't even amend. Right. Yeah. The part, the part that I think my favorite thing in Genesis that I was talking about this yesterday is I love the fact that uh, Joseph and his brothers, uh, I know this sounds funny, but but when he's down there in the pit and he's screaming and they and they decide that they aren't going to kill him. I just love, there's some, I don't know, they, I don't, I can't think of any, there probably are stories in other religions like that, but it just seems kind of, a, there's something wonderful about that, that they're, they're going to kill him. But then they hear him screaming. And they're like, "Well, you know, we can't really kill a brother." That, and then, and then they do a terrible thing. They sell him. They sell him into slavery. But they sort of take, you know, they change their mind. Exactly. And I find that to be kind of, you know, <laughs> very right, human and strange. Oh, but also, the whole thing is so strange. So yeah. right. And God changes yes. God's mind. Yes. Also, yes. Which right. is uh, yes, that's wonderful. Yeah, it yes. is wonderful too. Right. They convince yeah. enough to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everybody right yeah well again you're talking about also the deluge right you exactly right exactly yes yeah yes. yeah so uh noah's the first drunk um it, it, i think of him as you know the first survivor who uh responds in an understandable way he curses his son and terrible traditions come of interpretation i would say misinterpretation come out of that you yeah. know racism um and uh but also, I also think it's very strange the way the young, youngest is off. Well, I'm a youngest, so I just like it, but often the youngest is kind of favored or the, you know, not the, the son who's supposed to be favored. And, and also always, I, this really bothers me, the, uh, we've talked about this before, but there, there'll be a blessing. That, in other words, God, the, the, there's a trickery, right? You know, that they, they, they can and and yet it works. I don't understand how that. I don't understand how a blessing that is given in trickery can still can still function. Exactly. Right. right. Yes. Amazing motif. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. That, and that, and that, that comes to the heart of uh, of Jewish self identity. If you read Genesis as a Jewish baby book, right? Yeah. There's this treachery between. Uh, I mean, Jacob is a sneak thief. Right. Right. His right. name. Uh, the, right. the Bible doesn't hide it. So right. His name means heal. He grabbed. Right. In, in both the metaphorical yeah. sense and the literal sense, he grabbed Esau's heel as Esau was going on first from the womb, right? But uh, um, the prophet Jeremiah will actually use Jacob's name to describe with deep criticism the Jewish people. You know, the level of critique of Jews, this is a, just a, a, the beginning of a reflection on the nature and origin of what we call anti Semitism, mm -hmm. a, a 19th century term born of German anthropology, but uh, um, um, that uh, the worst things that you could say about Jews are already there in the Hebrew Bible, you know, especially in the mouths of the prophets, uh, but not only. So um, this is not a people that loves itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and therefore the awareness that you bring as a 21st century Jewish artist, so I just don't understand how, you know, mm -hmm. the, and yet you also appreciate that these brothers who are Virtual intended to be murderers, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just sold them into slavery. Right, right. right. Um, but you, you, something warms inside of you. 
that's your religious to my in my mind that's your religious soul and uh, you know I, I'm, I'm not a chauvinistic jew exactly and you know I'm, I'm, I'm not tribalist but i see that as you know not uniquely but specifically jewish that sense of uh that uh, even you know they made a distinction one of my teachers you mentioned max hartman was his name david hartman used to say the, the, the role of Jewish law, he had a very idealized sense of what Jewish law was about. I think he eventually, uh, you know, died deeply disillusioned uh, that his vision of the ideal of Jewish law was never embraced by his people. He said, the law lights a candle inside of a sewer. The sewer is this metaphor for human psychology, human history. The, the candle is this ability to change your mind, to make a distinction, to stop what you're doing mm -hmm. and reconsider. <laughs> that's, that's, thank you, Ilana. Yeah. So that's, what, that's why it's so powerful. Stop in the name it's of you love. And, your, and your beloved husband. So, that are, you know, and that, and, and, and yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Michael. No, no, I'm, two things. First of all, I'm curious to see if people in the audience have questions, but, and maybe I shouldn't ask this, but Jonathan, you, you've always taught me, you ask, questions, you know, because it's a question that's on your mind. So I've been staring at that scene and you staging that scene with you as Abraham and Nick as the angel and this goat, which is like a bat signal, but a goat signal. And I'm just well, trying to... That's the ram. Right. That's, ram. Right. that's the but, poor ram that's going to be substituted for... Is there, like, is there, like, I'm trying to think about the meaning of you putting you and Nick in that scene as those characters. Is there like a well, psychoanalytic? Um, I'm sure, but I'm not supposed to, you know, if I, if I, if I explain it, then it would be, uh, <laughs> then it would be properly repressed. Right. Like they're say <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look, it, it's, it's a scene that is, uh, that actually in the history of art is used as a kind of homoerotic scene. And often, because Isaac gets to be, you know, almost completely naked and or naked in in a lot of these depictions particularly in Caravaggio and Caravaggisti paintings right so but it's an opportunity I will take any opportunity to do something that's homoerotic so that's that's part of why it's an important scene in it but also you know in real life Nick gets often stops me from doing stupid things so it seems to be that that's a good image and it's definitely I mean, he literally uh posed for, posed for it so um you know also in the bible it's 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 such a horrible you know, sequence, you know, here, here, this child is given, it's a miracle child, right? And am I right about this? You know, the, the, the Sarah is, is she's barren, she's, she's nine barren, years old, right? And then suddenly she's given this child. And then, then God says, you have to go sacrifice the child. I mean, what kind of sadism is that? Right? And the name Isaac, Right. Means laughter. Right. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I didn't mention that to you. Yeah. 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 So, so, but so it's sort of sometimes seen, I mean, again, it's one of these stories that is weirdly interpreted as, you know, in the, in the end, how beautiful it is that God doesn't, you know, doesn't take the sacrifice, but in fact, it's such a, the whole thing is so mean and vicious. I once said to a psychoanalyst who I was a psychiatrist, say, so the sort of, uh, who, who, whose field was Trump and who himself was a Holocaust child, Holocaust survivor. He was here at Yale, Dory Laub. He was mm -hmm. one of the founders of yeah. the uh, Archives for Holocaust survivors. and trauma. And trauma. <laughs> so, and, yeah, and he was a psych he worked in trauma. So, he, yeah, so um, I once had him on Rosh Hashanah. He read this story on Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> And I, I was with him, and I said uh, in a characteristically snotty way, that I, I don't do so often anymore, John, but, but I said, so, Dr. Trauma, what do you say to Isaac after that? And Dory, very quietly, just said, I said to him, I'd say to him, keep your eye on the angel. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Poor kid. Yeah, they had to go through that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no resolution there. But the point, the point that I like to make is the one you made earlier. You know, they reconsidered. They stopped. Yes. He stopped. Yes. Abraham stopped. He could have ignored the angel. You know, it's right. not just the angel that stopped him. Rembrandt gets it wrong. Rembrandt has the, you know, it looks as if I, you're somewhere between it. 
Nick's, Nick doesn't look like he's exercising great restraint on your arm, but that's random. <laughs> Uh, but the, 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 the Bible just as the angel calls out, has to say Abraham twice, Abraham, Abraham, right. you know, as if the first call wasn't enough to wake him up, uh, you know. So, yeah. And then the whole Hagar thing actually is pretty awful too. It is awful. That uh, she sends her, the servant out into the desert, but then beautiful because God saves the child. Exactly. Right, so that's a good, good one for God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a trauma that Abraham, yeah, it's good. Abraham carries it though. Right, right, right. Because he was willing to perform this act right. you know, because he already, uh, he had already, you know, God had said to him, Sarah said, I want that child out of my house. Yeah. And Abraham didn't want to do it. And God says to him, follow your wife, listen to your wife. Mm -hmm. So he does. And now he's going completely against his wife over here. Mm -hmm. She dies after this event. And this, when she hears about this one, it just takes. Agar does not. Yeah, yeah. The, so the stories are so dark and yes. intertwined, and yes. yet there is light in them. Yeah. I love the sensuality the, in all of them, the, the, not just the color, but I, you know, I love that Genesis is filled with genitals, as it should be, you know, and uh, it's it's alive, it's really alive, Jonathan, and it's got it's got hope in it. And, uh, and even the Joseph's pit, the brothers, the faces of the brothers, what a vision. Where's that? It's over there? Is it, it, over, right there. over there, yeah. Um, I just, I'm blown away by that one. And uh, uh, I mean, and the, the, black, the black prince that you said you traced back to. Uh, to the Sardis yeah. 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 Very, very. But that's, I, I kind of like it when I do something that is iconographically different. I don't think there is a version where where the where people see the brothers looking down mm -hmm. at. Um, I can't think of a, no. an art history one where anybody's looking down. You know, and so it's the viewpoint of him looking up at that and what that would be like if your brothers had put you in this thing. Exactly. What an amazing uh, move on your part. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm not being gratuitous. I, I, I'm thinking you might want to yeah. maybe more of those. You know, in terms of um, well, different angles of Joseph, but seeing the world through Joseph's eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, what are the two of you think if we see if, I mean, I have some more questions, but I wanted to see if maybe anyone else, we've been talking quite a bit, and does anyone else who has any questions or comments? Well, I have, I have a comment. Um, it's about the portfolio, Chris, yes. because um, I've been showing it to people that when they come visit. And it's really interesting to see all the different responses. Like people look through it and they are familiar with some of the stories and they have different attachments to them depending on their backgrounds. They're always finding, they, when we do the fold of Noah's Ark, that's incredibly disarming. Mm -hmm. And then there's always um, humor that comes through too. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, that the portfolio operates so much like um, sort of traditional groups of prints that were in portfolios that you're actually supposed to look at them, read through the layers of meaning, um, and find within familiar stories, new things. People who know art history just always laugh when they see the Picasso, but then they notice Washington burning in the background. And people actually often laugh when they see the brothers looking down from the well. Like that's an image that stops them in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's being here today and seeing some of the same images in the windows and the images as they operate in the prints. Um, how do you think they work differently in the different formats or, mm -hmm. you know, when you see them up in this kind of four, a series of four and they tell their own stories mm -hmm. and then the prints tell a different kind of. Hmm. Well, no, I mean, I think what you said is exactly right. I mean, that you can, you know, that you can sit and look at them and, um, I, I I kind of enjoy particularly young people. I mean, it's a kind of funny thing is that people, and, and it just sort of shows where we are in art, where when I was younger and certainly in art history, you're used to this thing where you're supposed to put in all these different little illusions, but people seem so like, oh, what a great idea to do that. Like, it's like, a, like I invented that idea. Like you should put little <laughs> things in art history. Like it's, like it's a surprising thing to do. And it's like, you know, hello, that's in all of art history, you know, like why, you know, and that's kind of great that people aren't saying to me, Oh, you're not original, you know. You're why can't you make it up? You know that kind of thing. So that's great. But on the other hand, it's kind of I, I wish that people would 
or I want people to keep doing that in art. I want, you know, to me, you know, it, 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 it's interesting in my own work that I maybe through most of my life, I wanted to do narrative art and for various reasons, I just never do it. But like partially because I can't make up things. I have to copy it from something or have somebody pose. I can't make it up the way Marie Sendak can. Um, at one point, I mean, this is a funny story. At one point, I actually said to Maurice, why could you give me some book to illustrate? And he said, why would you want to do that? You wouldn't want to do that. You should, you should want to do that. You do what you do. You know, you should do that. So, you know, of course, in way, you know, there's an Oedipal thing. Like, like after he died, then I could suddenly make, you know, stories, right? And then how outrageous to make stories from the Bible, which is just, you know, Completely. I mean, you can tell that I don't know enough. I don't really know anything about the Bible. I know very little about the Bible, and here I am illustrating illustrating the Bible. It's outrageous. Really well, it shows you that the well, knowledge of the Bible doesn't necessarily help. Well, it, it, it's in a certain way we all have this knowledge, but it isn't it isn't necessarily things that we've read or right. It's that we it's it's this baggage that we have. But what you said is just wonderful that you can have it and look at it. And see it this way but here it's all about the you know to me it's about the color and you know being able to see it you know just to to make a kind of painting that people that's animated because the light to the window changes it i mean people people don't um i mean right now for whatever reasons they they won't they won't look at a painting that's just a painting of flower i do lots of flower paints i do lots of paints of naked men and you show it to curators, whatever, and they have no interest in that, you know, in a way. They, they say it's beautiful, but they, you know, it has to, there has to be some kind of politics behind it. And not that this is particularly successful either, but I don't know. It's, it's maybe a way to... of politics and yeah. intentional reality, in terms of making the multiracial statement on the mm -hmm. ladder, mm -hmm. um, was that your intent? Yes. No, no, definitely. Definitely. You got that. And also this, that's why this was such an important story. Hagar's story is so important because there's a whole, a whole p other people. This is right. Hagar. Right, right, right. This is the difference of the little, and the little boy's game of water is coming and she's being wow. banished into mm -hmm. the desert. Yeah. So that was definitely my intent. Yes. Yes. But you know, Subtle. I thought it was subtle. I don't know how subtle. If I thought it, it would be better. I think there was, yeah. Also, I, also, by the way, um, I don't know if you noticed, but Adam is also mm -hmm. right. But I didn't you know, want to make a big deal of that. Just, huh. Jonathan. Yes. We're getting the black and white print versions and the wonderful painted versions. But you've alluded over these this conversation to process, and I'm interested to know as to how you prepared to do these things and those things because they were not born just without preparation. No, no. So, so I, I I do have sort of a description of all this. So this is really strange process. So um, you know, I for years and Andrew Rafter asked that brilliant question. It's an amazing printmaker, but also we're colleagues. I taught in a printmaking department at RISD, but I didn't teach people to make prints. I've made prints off and on in my life, but I, I always find it, I don't like the idea that you can't change things really easily, easily, mm -hmm. right? You know, and I, and I came up with this sort of way to do this work where I would work out the drawings actually on an iPad, on an iPad using an iPad, doing it digitally. Then I would turn them into late. I use a laser cutter to cut them into plates. And then that's what I would print. And then because it was so easy to keep remaking the plates, I could keep changing them. And, and then they, I use that to then create the final plates that were actually printed by um, Dan Wood, who uh, has a letterpress in, in Providence. So there's a really long process. There is process is really important. And, and then there's 
through that whole thing, I sort of said to you, you know, about how I can't make anything up. So this is, this is, you know, somebody will, I'm not, I'm not going to like advertise all this or show you the to you, but there are these source things that I make where I take pictures and I get them from the web and I take paintings and I, I make this whole kind of elaborate sort of collage thing that I then end up using as sort of the basis of the image. So mm -hmm. that's also behind that. And I, and I have to say again, I, I, you know, I obviously I've alluded to this many times that, um, that part of my extended family, Maurice Sendak was part of that. And I know for a fact that a lot of his books, that's the way that he worked, that he worked with a light box and he often would trace directly from photographs, but he could make up people. I mean, he could just draw people out of his head. So I'm not saying that the wild things were done that way. I'm just saying that, but he often, if he needed something or had a face that he wanted, or there was a painting that he liked, he would just copy it and put it into the picture. So I feel free to do that. And, you know, in the history of art, you see that again and again. And you know that you have to have sort of faith that if you do it right, that you'll change it enough so that, not that you'll hide it, but that it'll sort of look like you did it, I guess, or it'll look like you. It drives me crazy that there's the, I mean, so many people are inclined to say, oh, that person just copied. <laughs> Where it's like, for, I know, you know, Jonathan shared with me a few months ago that amazing Maurice quotation of a Van Gogh sorrowing man. Right. And it's clearly an homage, right? right. He, he's paying homage to Van Gogh and one of his images. It's it's not just about copying, it's about you know responding to right. Well, he would, you know, there's there are many different sources for this. You know, Picasso's that well, great artists steal, they don't right. they don't borrow or something like that. Not to say that I'm a great artist, I'm just saying that the idea is to do it in a way that you can somehow make it your own. And um, and also, you know, so I, I love that idea that people kind of enjoy finding right. the thing. It's almost like a puzzle. Oh, you <laughs> took that from here and that came from here. What's wrong with that? And that was actually, again, you know, that was the way that through much of the, you know, last 500 years that actually People did that with paintings in the past. They they enjoyed the fact that a particular and actually they expected the artist to do that. That was something that was a sign of of that you were part of a tradition, right? That was actually a good thing, right? Not a not a sign that you were not able to uh, come up with your own ideas, right? Yes. So uh, I was just making the comment that part of the. Uh, uh, being part of the tradition, I said, there's nothing more traditional I, I, uh, than um, than um, uh, stronger or weaker misreadings of all the of, of, the, of these texts in particular. <laughs> and I think that's sort of what what you know much religion is. Right, right. It's just that you know, again, when you do it in art hopefully you know you're not like you're not killing anybody you know that's the other good thing like, <laughs> you know what i mean that's the thing the problem is that a lot of these so-called misinterpretations of the bible allow you know people to do the monstrous terrible things that they do right and and it's certainly i'm sure there are works of art that it's also influenced people to do bad things but um, by and large, you can sort of, you know, that's the, that's that's one of the things too, is that it's fantasy. You know, you're you're creating something that is, uh, you're working things through, and just because you're doing that doesn't mean that you want it to be that way. It's just something you're working through. I think. Is there a connection between killing and fantasy, and uh, the story of Joseph's brothers reconsidering, would um, stopping the killing and fantasy, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, and the problem of um, well, and 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 I mean, would you you set up a contrast between religion, right. which uh, I think you were alluding to the tragic historical fact that people many many people have killed and been killed in the name of uh, religion in the name of God, right? right? And so, uh, um, is the world of fantasy an al an alternative, or uh, has it got any uh, healing power, or uh, I mean, the religion of art, you said, if I have a religion, it's not. I'm just thinking, um, uh, um, are, you, are you offering in your work a critique of religion? 
in a, in a uh, intentional way. Well, I think I think so. Yeah. So so it's this sort of idea of working through. So we can we can say that um, we can say that one of the things you've got this very heavy subject, but we can say that one of the things that that the Bible is most about. I mean, probably most fundamentally about. Uh, and so much of art is about is what happens when people die, right? Why is it that that a child dies? Why is it that monstrous things occur, right? If there is a God, right? So that so the seemingly cruelty and arbitrary quality of a lot of these stories are trying to make sense. We can say that or to make sense of of something which is completely senseless, right? Um, what artists do is they take chaos or, or they take uh, of matter, this, this you know, base, worthless base matter. base matter, and they make it into something wonderful. But what the other thing they do is they turn it into the form, they give it order, they give it structure, they, turn, they make things beautiful. So in another way, this supposedly comes from Heidegger, I guess, is that they're, they're, high, they're their proposals about how you know how beautiful the world might be how 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 controlled how ordered things could be in an ideal world right or they're, or they're working through of sorrow unhappiness into something which that which comes together right whole in a way that life isn't right right you know I mean, so, yeah. this is part of the, it just makes me think of, I mean, there was a subtext for me to ask can you about the, the relationship of this work to some of your earlier work, because you really, you know, you explicitly connected this work to our current pandemic moment. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your early work was tied and emerged from you know, an epidemic or pandemic mm -hmm. that was uh -huh. particularly deeply felt by uh -huh. the gay community in that period, obviously the AIDS crisis. And I've just been thinking a lot about that. And I think, you know, I mean, I don't know if there's anything to say about that, but, you know, when you brought up that idea of death and then finding meaning out of it, it just resonated for me because it's interesting, you know, I've been thinking a lot recently with some of my own research about that period. And I just don't think, I think that being in the LGBT community, our current COVID moment has a different, at least for me, I don't even have to talk about community. For me, having lived through the AIDS crisis, mm -hmm. COVID just is a different thing. It has resonated in a different way than I think people who are straight and really did, AIDS did not register in the same mm -hmm. way to them. So, you know, well, no, I think that, that's definitely true. It's also, Jeff, and, you know, you're older. So, um, you know, I, it, it's funny because I go back and think about the 80s when so many, you know, some of my very closest friends died and how unbelievably terrible the 80s were, but it doesn't feel so um, despairing as, um, as like 19, uh, 2020, you know, the Trump, you know, 28, that whole period with the president and everything just seems so horrendously terrible and and the illness and everything else. But part of it is also you're old, you know, and you don't have the same energy and, you know, and the and everything that you have when you're younger. But I, but, you know, it definitely, definitely seems very, very different. And also maybe also not so terrible because everybody seemed to be affected by COVID while it seemed like, uh, uh, almost biblical in the way that a community was yeah. being targeted in the 80s. That's yeah. what what seems so so terrible. So so I mean you know part, one of my one of my shticks though it's weird because I think of myself as being a very pessimistic person, but for some reason I'm constantly the voice that keeps saying to people, um, you know, when people say, "Oh, this is the most terrible time," it, it's it's the most horrible time in America, the most violent, we're the most separate. And I'll say things like, "Well, you know, in the late '60s, you could, if you had a beard and long hair, you couldn't drive, you know, south into into the south. You'd be beaten up. You know, my brother would be beaten up or whatever. You know, fine for civil rights. And you know, John Kennedy was assassinated. Martin Luther King. You know, so I'm the person who keeps saying." 
oh my God, look how terrible it was here. Or I'm reading about, uh, you know, people not being able to escape Germany in 1940. You know, in other words, life has been really bad consistently for a very, very long time. And it's what, what did you say about the sewer? Like you have to light a candle in the sewer. You know, it's, it's, um, it's what can we do? How do we hold ourselves together? Right. And it seems to me that art is, is the, one of the ways to do that, right? In the midst of all this is terrible. Yes. We had a question from the Zoom chat oh, cool. uh, that kind of feeds into this conversation really right. serendipitously, right. which was what is the shelf life of these sort of faux stained glass materials? And if there is a, an ephemeral quality to them, do you think that that's connected to why you started using them during the pandemic? Right. So I have a similar set of windows, as I said, in my house, mm -hmm. and they seem to be holding up. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I have no idea. I have no idea. But I didn't choose them. I assure you, I didn't choose the medium because I wanted it to disappear. <laughs> um, I, I would think that it's a medium that is specifically meant to go in windows. So I'm hoping that it will, you know, fade away. But I have no idea. And I don't know any, but I don't. I don't think anybody does. I have some from when I was a kid, but that's 26 years. That doesn't really give you much oh, of an really? archival quantity. But well, no, well, a little bit. It's a little slice. Yeah. Nothing's like, wait a minute. We're going to tell me about that. <laughs> Not hand. They, they still look fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's sort of, I think it's sort of painted Elmer's glue is what I Essentially. think it is. Yeah. And it seems, <laughs> it seems pretty good. The ones in our house have been, been there for like three years and they have not faded at all. And they're in the sun all the time. So it yeah. seems pretty good. Not too shabby. I hope this, whoever this person is, they're considering buying one. <laughs> like, I'm thinking about it. It'll last forever. Yeah, <laughs> you have to start selling to people. I, I don't know yeah. Jonathan? Maybe it might be time to start wrapping up, but I was wondering yeah. if Jim and or Jonathan have any sort of last words or last thoughts to leave oh, us with. You, Michael. I, I have, I, I'm not sure if this is a question or a last word, but. Uh, it's only in print that you have, and it's here, I believe, um, Jacob Wrestling the Angel. Uh, what, the, only in the print, so I've never yeah. done a painting. Not on a window. Yeah. No, not on a window. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. So I found that to be incredibly erotic. Uh -huh. um, but I'm also thinking, since I, you know, I know yeah. much yeah. of the stories and the, and the mission and so forth, I'm thinking that, you know, while that's a contest, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's an element of struggle to it, not unrelated to the latter, you have a lot of Jacob here. In the latter, you have Jacob and yeah. Joseph, you know, yes. and, and you have uh, Jacob wrestling. Mm -hmm. um, that at the end, while he prevails against the mm -hmm. angel uh, and, uh, and wins a blessing, which turns out to be a change of name, uh, he also ends up wounded mm -hmm. forever. He walks away wounded. Uh -huh. and so I was thinking uh, in terms of Michael's question about art coming out of pandemic and, uh, and being uh, in your own sense of mm -hmm. art you saw the angels going up. I, I, I remind you they come down also. Mm -hmm. But in your mind, that ladder is one of ascent, mm -hmm. and uh, and you describe that as the work of the artist. Mm -hmm. And I think to what Michael, you both said about taking coarse mm -hmm. base matter and, and mm -hmm. elevate, elevate. Um, but but it, it, in, in the end, uh, as you're responding to people to think this is the worst time we've ever lived in, what you've said to them is, um, in, in effect, we're all wounded. Mm -hmm. but we can prevail something like that maybe um well oh no no plug it in yeah. on your end i've been fighting this lay all day i won't let it die <laughs> and there it is it's just the argument um well, I, I don't know about this idea of prevailing. That's I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, if it's if it's death, no, we're not going to prevail. We're all going to die. So, I mean, that's, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this, you know, part of me, uh, this idea that art lives and, you know, what is it? Art's long, life is short kind of concept. I, you know, one of the things that I have an art historian, you mentioned the AIDS crisis and, um, my, my dear friend, Mark Lita, whose uh, work, you know, has had a little bit of attention on it, but it's kind of, you know, it's right on the edge of disappearing. And there are so many artists um, who, who uh, lived in that, uh, died in that epidemic, whose work is disappearing. So, you know, if nobody, if nobody remembers your work, if nobody keeps your work, then it disappears, right? 
Um, so I, I don't know about prevailing, right? You know, there is this mm -hmm. fragility that we're aware of, but but it gets us through the, to the next day, you know, keeps you going, sustains you. That's a good way, way to do, but I don't know about prevailing. Do you, you I just want to make one comment on that on the latter of the image of you keep saying, don't forget they're coming down. Yeah. And the, the image I am receiving as I'm listening to is that because you said it's the it's the artist, but the artist has to bring it down to earth mm -hmm. for us to see it and right. receive it. And yeah, we all die too, you know. So we, there's no way to overcome it, you know. But um, there's no there's, exactly there's no overcoming. No, right, there's no right, overcoming. Right, there's right. there's a but there's like you said, you find a way to sustain right, yourself. Right, right, right. As yeah. Ellie Wiesel, I sat through a course he did it. Yeah, he used to say. You know, talking about these horrible memories and everything. He said, never do this. Thank you. Yeah, so, so yeah, but uh, thank you. Yeah. Can I just say that, Jim, you know this better than me, but, but the, the, the struggle after the uh, Jacob's new name. Uh, it, it, after the, the account of the angel, it's not prevail. It's struggling. Israel is, is struggling with beautiful God, right? So That's it's right. Not yeah. prevailing over the angel. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. 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 So just yeah. And do you have any last? I, have, I, I, I have, well, I have, want to say one. I want to. I start out with a correction. I want to maybe end with a correction. <laughs> I mean, Jonathan, you just. You, I was surprised because you said you don't think of yourself as optimistic or you think of yourself as pessimistic. And I have to say, yeah. I mean, I've known you for a good amount of time. And in the last few years, at least relationally, I find you so much more optimistic than me, which is, you know, <laughs> oh, uh, there you go. And, um, <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I think like all these people came and there are people on Zoom and the images we're looking at now are, as we're sort of all saying, yeah, it's not about prevailing, but about a kind of sustaining or sustenance. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually, I was surprised you said it because that's not my experience either of you or of your work. Oh, no, that sounds, that's nice. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, thanks for everybody coming. Yeah, thank you so much. Can we have a robust round of applause for our panel?